Okay, so to bring together what I've been talking about so far, I'm just going to do a small little kind of case study recording about graffiti. Uh, to begin with, there's a bunch of links in the um, lecture notes that you can um, have a look at some different, mostly videos. There's one there to, with me talking about um, tags and street art on um, local radio, and then some other kind of links to some stories and some um, old school graffiti videos and a few other things there. Um, so if you're interested in that, please check that out. Uh, the photo on the corner there is a tag on the side of my house. So I live um, in Cooks Hill where there's like a wall um, and I have a wall, a kind of exposed wall. Over the years it's been tagged more and more and more and like, you know, sometimes I find it a little bit annoying, sometimes I don't really care. But then a few months ago someone uh, did this um, on the side of our house, like a little cartoon dog with a tag underneath it. And I've got to tell you, we really like it. We'd like to see that guy come back and do more on the side of our wall because it looks really good. And I suppose this kind of liking or not, you know, tags and graffiti is kind of what I'm going to get into for the rest of this video. Um, again, these are some more examples in Australia. Um, the th first three um, ones there are um, a very controversial and... Um, I suppose tag for want of a better word because it's so massive by the uh, very well-known Australian um, artist called Nost. So the bottom one there is actually shows the mural that he tagged over, the, which is um, actually a really kind of important and very well thought of and very much loved feminist mural that's um, had its own kind of political history. Nost comes along kind of does this kind of huge um, you know, destruction of the mural with his own um, tag. And, you know, the third photo there is, um, so you can see, ironically, a council worker, you know, painting over some of the tags on top of the new tag. Um, so there's a link there if you're interested in that story to kind of read some aspects of that and the history and how that kind of played out. The one there of the two kissing Kanye's is also a really interesting story. You know, uh, Kanye West, a pretty homophobic, um, Artists sometimes, you know, so the artist puts this up as a kind of statement about that and he's kind of, uh, kind of, I suppose, critique of Kanye um, and contacts Kanye and says, you know, I'll take it down for $100,000. Um, no one responds, but there's a bit of a story afterwards where it kind of, he ends up actually being able to sell that artwork, which is really interesting. And again, talks to some of the um, tensions that I'm going to talk about throughout this, this section. So one of the uh, things we'd like you to read is um, uh, about graffiti is the uh, work by Kevin MacDonald, an Australian sociologist that I think lives overseas. Um, and his book, Struggles for Subjectivity, has been really influential on my the way that I think about youth studies. Um, that whole book, I think, is quite amazing. He um, does some really in-depth and up-close research with uh, a bunch of different um, young people experiencing marginalisation and discrimination and all kinds of inequalities from various perspectives, uh, one of which is um, about these graffiti artists and taggers. And what he points out is that, um, you know, what many may see as kind of senseless acts of destruction or vandalism, for those doing it, it's much more than that. So something like tagging to the people that um, McDonald um, interviewed and hung out with, um, at the centre of that experience, there's all kinds of questions of identity, recognition and struggles struggles within the subculture um, about, you know, who's the best and, you know, having various forms of capitals. Um, and these are kind of revolve around having a name, respect, fame, and particularly the visibility and the intensity of the risk experiences of putting up your, um, of your tag, you know, in particular prominent and risky spaces. And I've got a really good example of that in a minute. So I've just kind of taken some not great <laughs> screenshots of, um, of some of the interviews there. But like, you know, Zepp says, the more you see the same tag, the more you remember it. It's as if it's good, you won't be forgotten. And that's just what everyone wants, people to see them. What happens if you stop putting up your tag? Zepp says, you'll be forgotten. Um, so I won't read all of those out, but you can look at some of the aspects of um, how these young taggers express the meaning of what they're doing that, like, you know, questions the very idea that this is just kind of vandalism or, or whatever. Um, Alison Young and, and is a particularly prominent um, graffiti researcher in Australia, and she's written with Mark Halsey as well, whose work I'm a little bit less familiar with, uh, familiar with. but they, their co-written paper on 
the effective dimensions of um, graffiti, I think, is really interesting. And again, it speaks to some of those tensions between what is art and what is vandalism or what is creativity and what is resistance and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Particularly the way that kind of edgy kind of understanding of what graffiti is is sometimes then co-opted and kind of sold back to consumers. And this you can think of this particularly around Melbourne, the way that kind of almost sells itself as this kind of cool, you know, city full of graffiti and has the the, um, the Graves Lane with the, the graffiti where people kind of gather around and go and look at that stuff. And there's a whole kind of politics around that in terms of the legitimacy and authenticity of what these kind of artistic practices. So they show how um, graffiti kind of, the object of graffiti, the, the graffiti itself, takes out this kind of weird liminal in-between um, position in multiple aspects of public space, law, crime and art, and they draw attention to the kind of some of the affective dimensions, how something like graffiti, um, you know, engenders a lot of kind of emotions and often, you know, whether that's kind of appreciation and, and love of the art or anger about, you know, whether it's, um, uh, whether it's um, unlawful or ugly or, or whatever. So like the McDonald research, they point out there's a road, range of motivations why people do graffiti display their aesthetic tastes, kind of display the kind of outsider, kind of shared peer activity, much like, um, again, McDonald was talking about, to reject boredom, to rebel, to thrill, to display their skills and gain status. Um, and like breaking the law is sometimes a kind of important part of these kind of transgressions, is what, um, what they call carnivalesque transgressions. And taking risks is also part of that as well, but it's not necessarily the primary motivation. Most of the artists they talk to, they talk about their practices as a form of art, not vandalism. And what's interesting in terms of kind of making the normal look strange here is they interpret blank, blank walls blank, as kind of blank space, not necessarily private property. And that's an interesting thing when you talk about it in terms of ownership. Who owns private space? Sorry, who owns pub public space, not private space? Um, but there's tensions between those two things, right? No one asked... I think, for have billboards and advertising everywhere, they kind of clutter up and um, seem to be what I would call visual pollution in many of our cities, for instance. Um, I particularly would like to see more kind of graffiti and tagging kind of spaces than have a kind of, I don't know, beer or bedding or whatever billboard in front of me. So there's kind of a, um, a challenge here to the normality, again, that kind of speaks a little bit to culture jamming that I was talking about earlier on. Um, again, that challenges the laws or morals, you know, why do we have all this kind of commercial graffiti billboards and why can't we actually, you know, put our mark on these spaces themselves? The photo in the corner there is a kind of a, quite an amazing example of that kind of risk and thrill stuff, that aspect of it. And so when this kind of photo appeared a bit on the internet, there was people kind of arguing that it must have been fake. But, um, you know, click on the link there to the video and you can see the people actually doing that, you know, crawling along that terrifying ledge to, um, to put their... Um, tag in a particular spot. So there's that kind of artistic, um, you know, struggles around it, but there's also then more kind of um, institutional struggles around it as well. So, you know, local council representatives have to deal with complex issues around this graffiti because much of the population actually likes it, while other constitutions, cons constituents see it as vandalism. Um, and again, this particularly relates to when, you know, cities start selling themselves, you know, on their edgy artistic nature around this kind of stuff that like Melbourne has and in some other places like um, New York certainly has. And um, I went to Argentina in 2012 for a conference and um, in Buenos Aires certainly had a kind of real um, tourist kind of touring, you know, you go on a graffiti tour of the city and go to all these edgy spaces and stuff like that, which was fundamentally enjoyable, but it was definitely part of the tourist mainstream culture as well. So again, there's kind of constant tensions here going on around what this practice is and what it's for. So is graffiti art, you know, is it co-optation? What is it? Um, you probably recognise the um, graphic artist Shepard Fairey's, you know, now almost iconic uh, uh, image of Barack Obama. Um, but like graffiti artists themselves tend to be quite, quite cynical, if not outright critical of these kind of um, politics and the use of their aesthetic um, in politics, in particularly in official politics. So I'll just kind of put a, um, a comment under the Shepherd Fairy video that I um, 
having the earlier link part, it kind of shows that like there's a there's real kind of ironies and hypocrisies, you know, um, in this kind of stuff. You know, to promote Barack Obama as hope, in one respect you can really kind of get on board with that being the first African American president. But then, you know, as president, you know, he used drones to kill more people than anyone ever before. Um, so what kind of hope are we kind of talking about here? Um, so this again brings us around, you know, as I was talking to the, about the case of culture jamming, about how much resistance can actually be symbolic. It doesn't need to be more material and physical than that. This is particularly the case as the aesthetic of graffiti has become incorporated into more mainstream things, you know, advertising, stencil art on footpaths and chalkboard menus and these kind of stuff kind of co-opt the, um, you know, DIY rebellious nature of what graffiti started as. It's been used by youth workers and stuff like that to try and identify with, you know, marginalised youth. And again, there's a kind of, while that kind of makes a lot of sense to me in terms of practice and being getting access and trying to help young people, it kind of would also, you know, destroy the resistive meaning of the practice itself and for people that are actually invested in terms of the authenticity of the practice is not likely to be too successful. Um, councils themselves now run a bunch of you know um, different uh, seminars and different kind of um, festivals around graffiti as well. Hit the Bricks in Newcastle is a really good example of it and there's a whole bunch of you know very large you know um, uh, pieces of public art done that. Hosier Lane um, is another example. I said the Graves Lane in Melbourne before, it's Hosier Lane, the graffiti, um, the graffiti lane. What we can also kind of think about here is more kind of broad understandings of what art is and who gets to decide what it is or the different context when something may be art and something may be vandalism. And class plays a real role, in class relations plays a real role in how this plays out. So, you know, the kind of tag in public space is seen as vandalism, but then if the right people see it as, like, being of value and, you know, see it as art, they'll put it in a, um, in a gallery and all of a sudden it's art. As long as the right people select it and say some stuff about it and it's tasteful and it has that kind of authoritarian knowledge around it, it becomes more legitimate. The example of Banksy that I'll talk about is a good example of that in a sec. So this kind of speaks to more broader things around art, that the way that art institutions themselves get to decide what's tasteful, what's, um, you know, what's high quality and all that kind of thing. Um, and, you know, what's left out of that tends to be, you know, working class practices, discriminated against people practices until they can be kind of co-opted and have the radicalness of their practice taken out of them and just kind of be used as a kind of aesthetic so Banksy is now the classic example of, of this kind of stuff, you know, street artist, become hugely popular. If you go to London, you can buy, you know, postcards of his images on every street corner just about. Um, began as an artist making overt political commentary using stencil art. Um, in a, like what I think is a classic kind of ballsy move, you know, when he was an unknown, he um, put up his own artwork in a gallery and put a little um, statement next to it. Um, to kind of take the piss out of the pretensions of the art world. Um, in that gallery, very dis quickly discovered it and very quickly took it down. But then he became world famous, and you know his artworks start all of a sudden, you know, demands millions of dollars, and that gallery then put it back up. So again, it's a really nice little pithy example there of you know what's legitimate art and what's not, and it's not necessarily about the aesthetic or the thing itself. It's about who's making the decisions around it, and particularly when there's money involved. Banksy's still making huge controversial and political artistic statements and if you're interested in his more kind of conceptual work recently, have a look up Dismal Land and the Waldorf Hotel. But his work now has become, like most famous artists' work, artists work become collector's items for, you know, the 1% or the 001% um, to be displayed in boardrooms and all that kind of stuff. And there's a whole kind of um, controversy and around, you know, when a Banksy appears, people try and go and find it first and either steal it or wall it off, and there's a whole kind of weird um, practice around that that you'd be able to check out in the Banksy doc documentaries. So what's interesting now is that, is Banksy's artwork subversive anymore? Those kind of just, you know, 
um, stenciled art that kind of make the normal look strange? Is they, are they just kind of preaching that they're converted now? Um, again, these are interesting questions to think about. And lastly, this is, I just want to kind of finish with an example here. It's kind of, um, you know, a kind of piss taking away of what I've been talking about. You know, a particular tag there and someone's come along and, you know, put up on the wall an artistic kind of tag, artistic label, I suppose, not a tag, that, um, you know, uses very pretentious, you know, the usual artistic kind of museum language to analyse and talk about the tag itself. I think that's a kind of nice encapsulation of some of the um, issues of power, um, issues of institutional recognition, um, and, issues, and issues of authenticity that something like graffiti is really interesting to talk about. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thanks.